There's more to TEE for cavity surgery than left ventricular assessment. How should we manage moderate valvular disorders? And what post-MI mechanical complications should we screen for? We're going to discuss these and more in this part two episode of Tea Time. Welcome back to Tea Time. I'm your host, Dr. Andreas Plakis, and this is part two of how to perform TEE for cabbage surgery. The clinical question that we've been covering is what should clinicians know to best perform TEE during coronary artery bypass graft surgery? Last time in part one, we went over the assessment of LV function, both the global assessment and then also the regional assessment looking at wall motion abnormalities. This time in part two, we'll focus on valvular assessment during these cases, and also specifically looking at post-MI mechanical complications that we need to look for. Let's start by focusing on valvular assessment during these cases. When we think about how to manage valve pathology during these cases, there's a couple considerations that we're going to look at. We're going to assess baseline valvular function for the purpose of deciding is a dual intervention needed where we ought to address the valve during the time of the cabbage surgery, and also understanding how ischemic changes in some of these patients can lead to valve complications or improving ischemic conditions can lead to improvement in valvular function. The other considerations we'll look at, as you would look at with any valve pathology, are taking into account the whole picture of the patient, such as how does the age, the patient comorbidities, and any alternative valvular intervention options influence our decision making in these cases. A lot of the evidence for recommendations for these cases comes from two major and wonderful papers, the 2020 ACC AHA guidelines for the management of patients with valvular heart disease, and then the 2021 European guidelines for management of valvular heart disease. Let's start by looking at moderate aortic stenosis. From the 2020 ACC AHA guidelines, moderate aortic stenosis at the time of other cardiac surgery has a class 2B recommendation for addressing with AVR at the time of surgery. Whereas from the 2021 European guidelines, we see a class 2A recommendation to perform an AVR at the time of cabbage surgery. And this is just a reminder, when we look at these classes, class one is a strong recommendation, class 2A is a moderate one, and class 2B is a weak recommendation. I'll let you read this list if you care to, but I'm gonna move on to the next valvular disorder. For moderate aortic regurgitation, what we see from the ACC AHA guidelines is a class 2A recommendation to address at the time of cabbage surgery. Whereas from the European guidelines, we see a class one recommendation for severe aortic regurgitation, but there is no mention of moderate aortic regurgitation in these guidelines. The next valve pathology we'll look at is severe secondary mitral regurgitation. And just a reminder that secondary MR is functional mitral regurgitation, and it's caused by LV dilation, as opposed to primary MR that's caused by problems with the leaflets or the mitral valve itself. For secondary MR that is severe, we have a class 2A recommendation to perform mitral valve surgery at the time of cabbage, whereas we have a class 1 recommendation from the European guidelines at the time of cabbage surgery. A unique subset of functional mitral regurgitation is ischemic mitral regurgitation. The mechanism we're looking at here is with progressive LV enlargement, you have annular dilation of the mitral valve, and you also have papillary muscle displacement. As that LV cavity enlarges, you have apical tethering where the papillary muscles become taut, the chordae become tight, and you have restricted leaflet motion during systole. So when the valve would normally coapt well, those leaflets are more restricted and can't coapt well, and so you have mitral regurgitation through that space. It's pretty common to see this slightly posteriorly directed jet when you have that restricted posterior leaflet seen in this echo clip. We're going to focus specifically on this posterior medial papillary muscle and this inferior and inferolateral wall when we think about how cabbage may actually improve MR without addressing the valve. Now, there's two schools of thought, and the first one is if you revascularize the PDA, which supplies that territory, most commonly the RCA in right dominant populations, whereas it could be the left circumflex in left dominant populations, you can improve left ventricular function 
and improve remodeling of that left ventricle, which would decrease papillary muscle tethering and increase leaflet coaptation, thereby improving the mitral regurgitation. However, if you attempt cabbage and it doesn't improve, the risk here is moderate MR that is uncorrected and worsens has been shown to lead to poorer functional status, more hospitalizations, and reduced late survival. So it's important to get this right because if you have the chest open and you may address it, it's got to be done correctly. And just a reminder that that posterior medial papillary muscle is one we focus on because it typically is more vulnerable to ischemia or infarction-related changes because of its single blood supply as opposed to that anterolateral papillary muscle. I'm going to go over the present society guidelines and what has been recommended over the last 15 years in a brief summary. In the 2011 ACCF AHA guidelines for cabbage surgery, it was recommended that moderate ischemic MR that is believed not to resolve with revascularization that mitral valve repair or replacement occur at the time of cabbage. In the 2020 ACC AHA guidelines, there were no statements even on moderate ischemic MR. However, in the same society guidelines in 2014, it was a class 2B recommendation to perform mitral valve surgery in moderate secondary MR. And finally, in the 2021 European guidelines, they give a few more factors and acknowledge it is a subject of debate, but they recommend and favor combined surgery when patient comorbidity is low, if the patient has exercise-induced dyspnea as opposed to angina as the primary symptom, and then if there's a large increase in MR severity over time or systolic pulmonary artery pressures. I created this graphic to help us weigh the factors that might go into play in deciding when to intervene on moderate ischemic MR during cabbage surgery. There's a lot of factors and it's not a black and white decision, but oftentimes it's a multidisciplinary discussion weighing all these factors and what might be best for the patient. We start by looking at patient factors. Can the patient tolerate risk of more cardiopulmonary bypass for potential MR reduction benefit? I help answer that question by looking at the age of the patient and patient comorbidities, where a younger age may favor lower risk for more bypass along with minimal comorbidities. Next step, I'll assess mitral valve severity. What is the clinical significance here? Is the MR significant enough that it just can't wait for future intervention or even not to be intervened upon at all? We'll assess this with TEE to see if it's mild or moderate, or is it moderate to severe, which may push us towards an intervention? or looking at patient symptoms, if they have dyspnea on exertion as the primary driver of symptoms, even more so than angina, that may signal greater MR significance. The next step I'll look at is left ventricular viability. Is left ventricular dysfunction reversible? Can cabbage improve left ventricular dysfunction and its associated MR? I'll assess this by looking at hypokinesis versus akinesis of walls. Is a wall thinned? or does it thicken appropriately? And even cardiac MRI may indicate some of the answers here. Whereas large hibernating myocardium that is revascularized may result in greater improvement in MR as opposed to very scarred and akinetic myocardium. Again, the question here is, if I perform the cabbage, will the MR improve on its own? And a very scarred myocardium gives a lower likelihood of that. Another factor here is looking at the coronary circulation and potential revascularization impact. If the inferior and infralateral wall has viable tissue and there is a stenotic coronary vessel that can be bypassed to improve blood flow to the PDA, then there's a possibility of improving posterior medial papillary muscle dysfunction, LV dilation, and subsequent MR. It's important here to know the RCA and left circumflex distribution. Are they right or left dominant to know which blood vessel is supplying the PDA and if it's possible that we can add blood flow to this region to improve papillary muscle dysfunction. Finally, the last step I'll look at is transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair eligibility. This tells me, are there alternative options available or not? Whereas if there's not alternative options, I may be more inclined to operate on the valve then and there to avoid a redo surgery. Versus if you know the patient can have a mitra clip a few years down the road, you may be less inclined to operate on the valve then and there. I'm not going to get into the details of surgical strategies here, but it is important to note that if we have a viable left ventricle with reasonable function, a complete undersized annuloplasty ring may improve function and may be appropriate if we're revascularizing here as well. Whereas if we have a non-viable, akinetic, severe dysfunction or dilation of the LV, or even have a P3 tenting angle greater than 29 degrees, we may err on the side of mitral valve replacement surgery. 
Lastly, for moderate mitral stenosis, in both sets of guidelines, there is no specific recommendation that occurs in cardiac surgery or cabbage patients. However, I think it's worth noting if we do have a valve area less than 1.5 centimeters squared, it may point us to address this at the time of surgery. There's a few other factors we're going to look at as well in addition to the valvular disorders we already covered. We want to assess the aorta in these patients because it can help determine a few things such as positioning of the aortic cannulation site, where a surgeon may place their aortic cross clamp, and even maybe a contraindication to certain types of mechanical support like an intra-aortic balloon pump. And if there's certain imaging tools you need to better assess and get answers here, you can always use epi-aortic imaging to get a closer look, especially at the surgical cannulation and cross clamp sites. Additionally, we'll try and rule out a persistent left SVC as this can affect our cardioplegia administration strategy. This may need to be occluded during surgery with either a clamp or a balloon catheter, or different types of cardioplegia strategies may need to be implemented. Also, we'll try and rule out a PFO as this may influence venous cannulation strategy if a repair is indicated. I want to touch briefly on finding an incidental PFO during cardiac surgery and especially during cabbage surgery as it's controversial what to do about this and whether repair is indicated. Some of these papers, especially the ones you'll see the screenshots of on this slide, would indicate that there really is no long-term survival benefit if repair is performed and it may even increase the stroke risk postoperatively in some of these patients. However, things that may push us more towards repairing at the time of surgery is if we have an aneurysmal septum, which may be associated with paradoxical embolus, a significant shunt where a QPQS is greater than 1.5 to 1, or a right to left shunt. Does the patient have a history of TIA or paradoxical embolus? And just to round it out, are they eligible for percutaneous closure in the future where we may not need to address any of this now? The last major section I want to touch on is post-MI mechanical complications. And these are specifically mechanical complications that can occur in the heart that are related to pathology changes that occur after a myocardial infarction. And frequently we'll see these three up to 14 days post-MI. The first one's an interventricular septum rupture that would cause a VSD, LV3 wall rupture, papillary muscle rupture that could cause acute mitral regurgitation, LV pseudoaneurysm, and then LV true aneurysm. And we'll go through each one of these. The first one of these to look at is a VSD. And this is common, as we mentioned, where you have rupture of the interventricular septum. So it could be in that RCA territory or the LAD territory, but frequently you can see these in the anterior septum after LAD infarcts. The next post-MI mechanical complication to look out for is an LV free wall rupture. We look for a rupture of the free wall, which can occur in the anterior, anterolateral, infralateral segments. One way we can diagnose these is with contrast echocardiography, where we'll see a pericardial effusion and that contrast material actually filling in the pericardial space. That can be how we differentiate it from other post-MI pericarditis that can also cause pericardial effusions. Another very important mechanical complication is acute mitral regurgitation. As we mentioned earlier in this episode, the posterior medial papillary muscle has a single blood supply from the PDA, so it's particularly prone to ischemic events that could cause rupture here, whereas the anterolateral papillary muscle is more protected. And frequently, you can see from this echo clip that you'll see a chunk of papillary muscle flailing, and that can differentiate it some, at times from a cortal rupture. An RCA infarct with an inferior or posterior MI puts the patient at higher risk of papillary muscle rupture. And that's specifically in this location where it's supplied by, as we mentioned, the RCA or left circumflex. Another important complication to be aware of is an LV pseudoaneurysm. This is known as a contained rupture of the left ventricle that's essentially contained by only clot and or pericardium. This can be defined by having a neck that is narrower than the widest part of the pseudoaneurysm. It's important to have urgent CT surgery evaluation as these have very high risk of rupture compared to true aneurysms, often called time bombs. Lastly, as we mentioned, true aneurysms are also a complication post-MI that can occur. And this is where you get thinning and bulging of all three layers of the heart wall and commonly found at the apex. The diagnostic features, in contrast with a pseudoaneurysm, is where the neck width is actually greater than the depth. And you'll see wall motion abnormalities in these with dyskinesis or akinesis in the aneurysmal segment. 
Frequently, complications can occur. And imagine because you have dead myocardial tissue, you can get heart failure because your heart's not functioning well. Arrhythmia is because a conduction system in that area no longer functions well. And because that heart's not moving well at all, it predisposes the patient to LV thrombus formation. And we'll frequently look into treating these with standard post-MI medical therapies. I want to touch on the main points for how to perform TE well during cabbage surgeries. We address the left ventricle and why it's important to assess left ventricular global function and even regional assessment of the left ventricle and how those can play a role in graft complication detection, such as kinking, occlusion, or poor perfusion. In this episode, we've looked at both valvular and aortic assessment and how it's important to screen for valvular disease to help decide if a dual intervention is needed and how aortic pathology can influence surgical decision making. And lastly, it's important to identify additional surgical risks by ruling out post-MI mechanical complications. I'm excited to say we are jumping into our first ever series of Tea Time. It's going to be our valve series where we look at a lot of different valve concepts and how they're clinically important for influencing when we do valvular surgery in the cardiac surgery ORs. The first one we'll look at is prosthetic valve evaluation, the essentials. I'm going to teach a system for how to quickly and efficiently evaluate a newly placed prosthetic heart valve. Thank you guys for watching. If you like this content and you want more of it, hit the subscribe button. Feel free to leave a comment if you do things differently at your institution so we can all learn from each other. And even consider writing a review as that really does help this content get out and reach more people. We'll see you guys next time.